Um, John Husband, welcome to my house. <laughs> Thank you, Vinay. It's a pleasure. Uh, we've become friends over the last couple of years, and uh, it's wonderful to be in London looking out over the green trees and the reservoirs. Uh, thanks for having me, and look forward to interesting talks. So tell me what's on your mind this morning. What's on my mind is what's on my mind all the time, which is... Uh, we're living through, you know, it's it's kind of banal to say, but we're living through an epochal uh, change in the way things are organized and done in the world. Uh, and so I walk through life uh, watching, listening, looking at patterns, uh, trying to understand what's going on. So you're best known for this concept, why Rocky, which you came up with uh, a number of years ago. Yeah. Um, so my understanding of why Rocky is that basically it's a name for what people actually do in terms of governance and social organization and networks rather than being a prescription. That it's kind of observation-led rather than being this is how we ought to do it manifesto-led. Is that right? Uh, I would say that that's one way of coming up to the subject. Uh, to be to be as precise as I know how to be, I worked for many years uh, with large organizations, uh, helping them define roles, jobs, structure, org charts as we know it. Um, and the society that we live in today, virtually everything we do, is built on some notion of hierarchy. We've come through 75 or 100 years of the last stage of the Industrial Revolution mm. looking for efficiency and optimizing uh, and so on. Uh, and the methods that are in place everywhere around the world now for organizing work and organizing people's activities, organizing business models, organizing government are based on hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I, about close to 20 years ago, 17 years ago to be specific, one day was sitting around thinking about how knowledge and information, particularly as it was beginning to become connected by the, the web, would change this relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, hierarchy is posited on the fact that knowledge is, information and knowledge is arranged vertically and used top-down by people that know more than anyone else does about something. And this, this is a very Buckminster Fuller thing, right? That I, Bucky talks about in Gruncher Giants, <clears throat> yeah. this idea that what defines hierarchy is the, uh, the kings would concentrate all the information about running of the kingdom in only their hands. So the military never knew the condition of the treasury, the treasury never knew the disposition of forces, nobody other than the king understood the strategic alliances. So anybody to displace the king wouldn't have the information they needed to succeed. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think it goes back even further than that. And, and here's my story. The day that this word wire archy, the archy of living in a wired world, popped into my head uh, was at the beginning of a career crisis because I had quit my job as a consultant helping uh, do that for one of the world's large firms and um, was thinking about all this stuff. This word popped into my head. The first thing I did was got out of the shower. I was in the shower, went to a dictionary and looked for the word hierarchy. And some words have a number of definitions in the, in the dictionary. Hierarchy is one of them. The first definition of hierarchy is the relationship between God and the archangels. Really? Yes. Good word. And... If you stop to think about how we've progressed through into modern society since then, mm -hmm. what we had at the time of Christ's purported death, the, the dividing line between B.C. and A.D., mm -hmm. is we had clans and tribes operating all around the world sure. as these social units. Sure. And the people that became the <coughs> leaders of the clans and tribes were either the strongest or the smartest or both. Mm -hmm. They, as we moved through history, became kings and queens. Sure. Sure. And families, we have a family here in, in London that still runs the king and the queen, or the mm. queen and the prince. Big Liz and her friends. Um, <laughs> big Liz and her friends. Um, and during the Middle Ages, along came a concept called the divine right of kings. Yes. In other words, God was giving his or her knowledge yeah. to the representatives on earth, which were the kings and queens, to yes. do with as they saw fit. And the knowledge was captured by the courtesans, which were the, the cardinals and the bishops, mm -hmm. telling their monks, the scribblers, to write down the knowledge that was important. Mm -hmm. What's really important to realize then is with the divine right of kings, there was this notion that God's knowledge was enshrined in the kings that gave them the power to rule. Yes. And then along came the Gutenberg printing press in 1462. Absolutely. And, you know... 
popularly or colloquially it's known as beginning to spread knowledge around, but of course it took two or three hundred years to work its way through society, yeah. and there were many book burnings because yeah. books represented power. Absolutely. Now here and we are with the internet. This is, this is one of the reasons that I say to people, you know, the political transformation caused by the internet hasn't even started. Correct. Right. I like, think. You know. Whether it's a good political transformation or a not so good political transformation is a different issue, and we will find out someday, or maybe you and I won't. Maybe we'll be dead by the time it happens. Well, I mean, certainly the surveillance stuff is very real. But it's very then real. So are all the revolutions that were organized online. Exactly. We uh, have this polarity happening now, mm. and one of the men I work with in Quebec, Michel Cartier, who I argue is the francophone world's equivalent to Marshall McLuhan in some ways. Okay. Uh, wow. suggests that we now have a fourth source of power. Before it was the church, the state, and the corporation. Okay. The fourth source of power is public opinion, which is shaped on the web. Mm, that's For better or worse. That's interesting. And I you'll see all sorts piece, of examples now, avaz.org, yeah. for I remember example. I remember a piece that went around. Now, when was this? It must have been shortly after 9-11, Talking about uh, there being a, a sort of, a, you know... A second superpower. Second Jim, superpower. Jim Moore. That's James right. Moore. Yeah, second superpower, James yeah. Moore. If you yeah. Google it, it's still around. It disappeared yeah. from a number of blogs. But it's yeah, basically yeah. saying the world connected up. Eventually, you know, the, the long arc of history points towards justice, points towards mm -hmm. democracy, whatever. Alvin Toffler wrote a lot about this in the book, Future, uh, not Future Shock, but Power Shift. Yep. Knowledge, wealth, yeah, yeah. and violence at the edge of the 21st century. And the, Rummel writes about it a lot as well. Yeah. Um, you know, University of Hawaii, the democide guy, talks about the democratic peace. Yeah. <clears throat> this notion that you know, no two countries with the McDonald's have ever invaded each other. Yeah. Which I think ceased to be true. <laughs> I can't remember exactly where it was that got invaded that had a McDonald's, but there was some place that got invaded that had a McDonald's. So. But what's interesting, the most recent let's say, example of this, is, the, is which has been relatively quiet, actually, is the Panama Papers. You know, That's quite a high bar for relatively quiet. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, the, the, the counter-arguments have already come that we're not doing anything illegal and so on. Now, mm -hmm. the question is, should the laws be changed? What I believe, one of the best uh, things that ever happened, believe it or not, because of Facebook, is that there is, an, and I, it's a bit of a pun, bit by bit, there's an accumulated weight and impact mm. of the awareness mm. of this kind of information. It, of course, depends upon who follows you and who you follow. There's lots of garbage on the internet yeah. and cat gifts and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it also is, in a funny way, becoming activism central. Oh, I think it's already, I mean, yeah. it's been established as activism central for many years. And so now the question is, we, we <clears> tend <throat> to analyze things very quickly and say, well, it's going to be like this. But I'm really wondering what the world will be like in the year 2025, after another 10 years of hyperlinks, plus another yeah, 10 years of yeah. surveillance. I was going to say, you know, I mean, the pivot on this seems to be that it's activism central, but it's also surveillance central. Yes. So, you know, the notion that you do your primary activist organizing in an environment where you're constantly under the watchful eye seems unlikely to produce fundamental change. Well, the question that r remains in my mind, I think basically I'm not as optimistic as I'd like to be. There's a, the, yeah, uh, the, the working yeah, definition yeah. of hierarchy is neutral. It's, uh, I, I've posited as an organizing principle, back to your, an emergent organizing principle, mm -hmm. back to your question, and that's a dynamic two-way flow of power and authority. You okay. could argue that's underway. Mm -hmm based on knowledge, trust, credibility, and a focus on results. Now, okay. each of those... So let me break that down. Knowledge, trust, trust credibility. credibility. Hang on. Has... So let me... So knowledge is pretty straightforward. Trust and credibility are separated. They're two separate things in your model. Let's talk about that a bit. Okay. Trust, credibility, and finally... A f either a focus on results, if I'm talking to corporate people, or a focus on generating economic and social value. Okay. Got it. Now... Um, <clears throat> I'd say each of those four elements is a generic phrase and, um, and thousands of books have been written about each one of them. So sure. they can all be unpacked. Layered yeah, over that as much is as like, context. Yeah. Context, context, context. So why the separation between knowledge, uh, credibility trust and, and credibility. trust? Trust is, for me, remembering that we are social animals. Remember we were talking mm -hmm. about Locke versus mm -hmm. Hobbes, which mm -hmm. I think ultimately this all backs into, yeah. um, is a fundamentally human thing. And 
as is credibility, but credibility is trust backed up with demonstrable facts, reliability, uh, etc. Et so cetera. this is trust but verified. So trust verified is what happens. Trust. So trust is what happens before you've got results. Credibility is what happens after you've Thank got you. results. Thank um, yeah. you. And too. what we have now in places like or, or new, <coughs> we've we've heard a lot about this emergent platform capitalism, mm -hmm. Uber, Airbnb, and so on. Yep. What we're starting yep. to see all around, and we're going to have this in blockchain as well, mm. is a certain threshold level of trust, let's call it credibility, baked into the interface. Right, right. And, right. and we have this to some degree with web browsers now, right? Exactly. You have HTTPS, it tells you very clearly that you know, you're paying attention to, yes. you know, this is Amazon, this is Google, we verified it, you have your little padlock, you're okay. Except that it's run by Amazon and Google, as opposed to run by open source uh, or some kind of entity that is not profit oriented. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this brings us directly around to the blockchain and its enormous yeah. potential for transformation of stuff. Um, so, I mean, you know, f I'm assuming most of the people that watch this will have some familiarity with the blockchain, but I'll give you the nickel summary just in case people don't. Basically, 1970s, we have the age of databases, one computer per organization. 1990, the age of networks, one computer per person. And at the tail end of that, we get the kind of cloud era, which is many computers per person tied together by the cloud. And then you get the blockchain kind of 2010 onwards, which is basically one single global computer, starting in a very simple form of Bitcoin, then rolling on to Ethereum, and then rolling on with a little bit of luck to the scaled versions of Ethereum, which will be supercomputer fast, yeah. uh, but as a single computing surface made of all these little machines, but connected together in such a way that it's a seamless whole, rather than being lots and lots and lots of independent units. So this is the, this is the big vision. And inside of that context, the notion that you could take a single global database like URLs, you know, what certificate, what key goes with Amazon.com, what key goes with Google, what key goes with Yahoo, what key goes with Apple, so that you know if a message arrives from Apple that it really came from Apple, all that sort of stuff seems like a natural fit for the blockchain. The hard part is how do we authenticate, how do we verify who should be on Apple? Right. I mean, you know, whose job is it to make sure that the key that we have for Apple is actually Apple's key? Because if you're not paying for that service, who's going to authenticate? Well, this is why I'm glad that I'm, we're talking about this because for the, for the following reasons. I am not a technologist. I barely understand what you just said. I do because I do pay attention yeah. and I'm trying to impact, understand the impacts. But I'm more of a sociologist, anthropologist. And what I see thus far with the blockchain is a great deal of interest increasing amounts of money being gathered together to put various forms and iterations of blockchain architecture mm -hmm. into being, but it's mostly all technologists and men or people with money in their eyes, mm -hmm. um, and relatively little attention being paid to ethics, governance, the resultant sociologies. Uh, Joy Ito has expressed recently some concern about that. And what I think is that, again, if you parse the working definition of hierarchy, a dynamic two-way flow of power and authority based on knowledge, trust, credibility, and a focus on results, it maps onto or lines quite closely with what we can expect from blockchain architecture, particularly as it moves out of the financial services area mm -hmm. and into education, government, healthcare, yes. uh, community organizations, et cetera, et cetera. As it sweeps through society, We'll have the user and service provider both in engaged in an interactive exchange of power and authority through the verification, through the identification, mm. and you will be capturing, uh, because of the context in which uh, a blockchain architecture is used, for example, in notarizing legal documents around real estate, you're capturing the pertinent knowledge you're establishing a threshold level of trust, mm -hmm. you've got automatic credibility because of the register, mm -hmm. and you generate a result. A transaction is completed. This is, yeah, this is interesting territory. Um, so in the existing sort of techno-social systems that we have right now, the fundamental question is always who owns the server? Voilà. Right? But if you go back a generation before that, the question was who owned the code? Right. So Stallman basically frees us from this notion that Microsoft owns the code, therefore it doesn't matter whose computer you're running, you're still running their software, right. your software. That's ancient history now. Well, to some degree, but the proprietary pushback, you know, Apple came very close to a monopoly, for example, on 
smartphones. Right. And if it hadn't been for Google and Android, that right. would have been a monopoly. Right. Now we have two actors, one of them mainly closed source, Apple, one of them mainly open source, Google and Android. But Google keeps taking away little parts of the openness right. of Android. I understand that. And part, then yeah. Microsoft invests in Cyanogen to try and make sure that there's still an open alternative. But that's Microsoft. So, you know, we've only just, by the skin of our teeth, made it into that terrain where we had openness on phones. Openness on computers, I mean, the truth is a lot of people have switched back to Apple even in the open source. So here's a, here's a naive question for you. With advanced or let's say next generation browsers and some of their capabilities, could the blockchain become an operating system? Um, that is a much more interesting question than you think it is. Okay. Right? I'd, so, I mean, I'm lost there, but I just it came to my head. Well, so an operating system is a computer, you know, it's a piece of software that you wrap around hardware right. to give you a set of kind of smoother interfaces right. so that when you want to read so a file... accomplish things. Well, so you want to read a file off the disk. You don't have to go and individually program the drive head to move, you know, 2.4 centimeters across the surface to this wheel, you know, to this ring. Right. That kind of stuff is all obscured by the software. So you could think of the blockchain as being an interface, an operating system. Right for many computers right. <clears throat> that gives you the abstraction that those many computers are, is, are actually one perfect computer. Right. right. So in a sense, the blockchain is actually an operating system. Okay. And I think as we go further down this path of scaled blockchains, it will become increasingly operating system-like because we've got more and more and more and more functions which are being represented through the blockchain. So there in my futurist-oriented imagination or framework, and keeping in mind the arrival of the printing press and that it took two or three hundred years for the real effects of the, of the press and books and so on, and magazines to have impact on society and mm -hmm. bring us to earlier form. Uh, well, I mean, democracy came from a long time ago. But I'm thinking of, given the way technology accelerates through society now, in 50 years, could the blockchain and browsers bring these elements of what I call wirearchy really to bear I mean, in a fundamentally different society with fundamentally different power structures. Now I know that many, many people will argue that, and, and to a large extent I agree, humans need hierarchy and we have always fought tooth and nail wars to establish power and dominance and control. And I don't expect that to disappear overnight, uh, you know, at yeah, all. Yeah, human nature is not changing. Yeah, but like human nature is always, we're still living, I think. At least not until the transhumanists arrive. Well, you know, there's that question. Uh, but we're still, I would say, arguing over the very deep definitions of, uh, opposing definitions of human nature mm. brought about in the late 17th century with John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. Yeah. Man is a social animal yeah. versus there is no such thing as society. You need... Uh, society in a state to control this animal on two legs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where we get to with the blockchain is this notion that if you have essentially perfect bureaucracy, then what you will get is an improvement in society. Yeah, so, and everybody will be fair because you have to be fair because it's recorded. And Well, I mean, it's not necessarily that they'll be fair, but it's that the cheating has to happen at a lower level than at a right. higher level. <laughs> right. So, for example, right? It's, the cheating is not baked into the business models that are exploitive. Well, think of Bretton Woods, right? You take the entire cultural standard that we'd had for thousands of years, the gold was money, and you basically continue the paper, which is originally a way of simply making gold convenient right. to use. Right. You abstract away the gold by basically selling it on the markets to pay the government's debts from World War II. And once it's paper and is representative of that idea, then you can start creating financial derivatives. Well, on, you get inflation. Okay. You get inflation and you get right. financial derivatives that bear less and less and less reality to the actual Absolutely. value. And this whole process starts with Bretton Woods. Right. right. Because once you give governments the ability to inflate, then they can print money when they run out of yeah. money, which is basically a tax on savings. Yep. Right. And that ability for the governments to silently tax and say, well, you know, we can't control inflation. Well, you control money supply, therefore you control inflation. The ability to trim off that kind of fraud is very core to the blockchain vision. But what people build on top of that, you know, the original sort of blockchain folks were very much libertarian, hardline American libertarian. That right. was the original Bitcoin ideology. Right. 
the Ethereum folks are a bit more pro-social, a bit more European model left, green, a lot of them well, Canadians. Well, Vitaly's Canadian. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> Uh, Falkfinger, the Pirate Party, mm. again, this kind of democratic socialist norm. So you get a very different future model of how everything should work when you've got people with those kind of political opinions as the people writing the software. Because fundamentally, the, it's ultimately well, going to be about power. So 70s model, right? You buy the hardware from IBM or somebody else, but you're always going to wind up running Microsoft software after right. that 80s model. But anyway, you see what I'm saying. Right? The software vendor, because the software was proprietary, had all the power. Stallman comes and breaks that shackle right. with open source, right. and we're still fighting to keep open source at parity with commercial operating systems, but there's no doubt at all that it's a viable fallback. We got that far. A little bit further down the line, we then get into a position where, um, you know, how do I say this exactly? It's just slippery. So you break the paradigm that the computer that you're using has a specific brand of hardware, by standardization of the hardware. Open source then frees you from commercial control of the software. Right. But where you get into in the blockchain game is the software is open, but because all the computers are running the same standards, when you want to get any kind of change, you either need an enormous number of cats to simultaneously decide that they're going to sleep in you know, their baskets now, and everybody upgrades the software at the same time, or you wind up in a position where you get arbitrary central points like Bitcoin Foundation telling people that they have to upgrade, and then you've got political struggles around the synchronization of the standards. So it seems like whatever we do, we get higher level centralizations. You know, the systems get more and more free, but you get more and more well, abstract and, forms and, of power. And the ultimate, I think, agreed upon centralizer in our societies, at least in the Western world, are, uh, is law. And I found it yeah, interesting yeah, yeah, that yeah. Uh, a month or two ago when I was here with you at the dinner, mm. there was on one side of a long table in the boardroom of the world's second largest law firm, uh, uh, a bunch of blockchain hackers and activists, and on the other side of the table were four senior partners from law firms and yeah. deans of the two yeah. important uh, yeah. university IT uh, schools in London, they were trying to figure out what's happening here. Mm. Oh, yeah. Because ultimately, what goes on will be somehow regulated and controlled, controlled by law. And well, it will have to be. Maybe, maybe not. But I mean, I've been in that meeting, right? Yes. You know, variations of it, UK government, you know, the UN, the Red Cross, the universities, the big law firms, the big four. Everybody is trying to get their heads around it. And this is a multi-step process because what people forget is how political the original foundation was. Well, and so your was. point, maybe, maybe not, is probably a good point to end because I think we're close to... No, we got, uh, we got, of, we got we five minutes. A few minutes. The maybe, maybe not thing is very interesting because, of course, quite rapidly, let's think of internet time, and I think in many ways quite prematurely, um, we're being pressed to come up with answers to this new set of conditions I've had thousands of people ask me, well, you know, what's the method for hierarchy? And I keep mm -hmm. refusing to answer this. Mm -hmm. I say it's an emergent organizing principle, depends on context, what you want to get done, what your culture is, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the maybe, maybe not brings up the notion of with hyperlinks, and there's clearly more and more impetus to pull into most initiatives various aspects of self-organizing Self-organizing right. right. work systems, right. self-organizing Which in a blockchain context we call well, DAOs, right? DAOs. Decentralized yeah, Autonomous Organizations, exactly. where you agree on the rules of the game, you publish the rules of the game, you automatically maintain the rules of the game. Well, and the automatically, there's a lot contained in that, but as you know, you're, you and I are both part of uh, ostensibly a, a, an autonomous networked organization called Ethos. Mm -hmm. There's also Inspiral in New Zealand. And there will be more and more coming along, and there are cities yeah. that are beginning yeah. to look at, you know, in Barcelona and, and Madrid, there is more and more activity coming from the grassroots, coming bottom up, mm -hmm. because people are saying, we want to say. Yes. I am generally the very skeptical of those movements, because I think that in a lot of cases, we replace democratically fair procedure. Uh, with cults of personality or with um, the term structurelessness. I generally agree with that. Where I might take issue with you is that in most places, what are dem the, the issue today is what is dem democratically elected and put into place has very often been corrupted. Oh, I, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about democracy in the sense of four-year electoral democracy. Right. But the notion that you have an enshrined set of procedures which define fair 
And if you yes. follow the procedures, this is fair. There's a very long history. Fair. I mean, democracy didn't occur overnight. Right. But the notion that what you want is rule of laws rather than men, what I see in a lot of the bottom-up stuff is that you wind up with rule of men. Yes. You wind up in a position where the most charismatic personalities are running the show. Well, that reminds us of uh, Clay Shirky's power law. Exactly. For sure. Right. Is the people that are either more articulate, more forceful in their personality, more charismatic, or more active. Or just dumb luck. Right? Or just dumb luck. Some of it's lots you know, of that. coincidence. And, it's, and I think there's not a coincidence that it's quite popular at the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Television shows like Vikings and Game of Thrones. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah but, it, but this question of whether bottom-up organization has to include cult of personality as a factor, right? The hope on the blockchain is that you could basically have bottom-up organizations that are ruled by law rather than ruled by personality. That you establish a set of voting procedures, you establish a set of property rights, you establish a set of your rules of engagement, and the, because the machinery is abstract, because it's not running on somebody's operating system or somebody's hardware, because it's embedded in something that's beyond our control, that in some way what you will get from this is uh, a, a rule of law in a position where otherwise you would have a rule of a personality. Well, I expect to see some essays, articles, and books about that. And what I personally would love to hear would be what Manuel de Castells would say about blockchain architecture mm -hmm. and its use in society. Because he's, as far as I, he's certainly probably the preeminent net network theorist uh, in, my, mm -hmm. in my mind. Um, but... I mean, it's going to have to be explored because I don't think the blockchain architecture is going to go away and I think it's going to get funded and be put into various initiatives in all sorts of fields. Uh, MIT Media Lab has already uh, put into place an experiment I was reading about the other day, you may have read it, mm -hmm. about um, granting academic certification yeah, using absolutely. a blockchain. Which is a really good use. It's a good use and you know, married to MOOCs idea. makes universities yeah. even more nervous, I would yeah. think. Well, yes, I mean, there's also all the open badges stuff from Mozilla that's overdue to be right. blockchained. Um, shall we do Hobbes versus uh, Locke in a little more detail in part two? Because I sure. think that getting to the bottom of this model of how does our model of human nature affect how we see technology is a really good piece of heavy lifting that we could do. Just to set a bit of context, let me read out um, a contrast between John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, who are both very influential in terms of the reflections on human nature mm. is as follows. Locke's considerable importance in political thought is better known. As the first systematic theorist of the philosophy of liberalism, Locke exercised enormous influence in both England and America. Mm. In his two treatises of government, 1690, Locke set forth the view that the state exists to preserve the natural rights of its citizens. When governments fail in that task, citizens have the right, and sometimes the duty, to withdraw their support and even to rebel. Locke opposed Thomas Hobbes' view that the original state of nature was nasty, brutish, and short, and that individuals, through a social contract, surrendered for the sake of self-preservation their rights to state and control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, you know, the, Thinking about hierarchy, uh, God possessing the knowledge, the relationship with the archangels, that being um, humanized, if you will, and brought down to earth from heaven in the guise of kings and queens, the divine right of kings. I would argue that today, um, corporate executives, uh, presidents and vice presidents are kings, cardinals, and bishops. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, um, the notion that what you have is a feudalism <clears throat> where rather than the underlying asset being land, the underlying asset is patents, yes. right? You have you have a piece of property which is essentially pooled by discovery. Instead of going to an island and finding the land, you go into the unknown, you patent something. You then rent people the use of the patent in the same way that the lords used to rent people use of land. Yep. And the result of this is a direct recreation of feudalism, but on an intellectual property basis rather than a physical property basis. Patents and monopolistic and or ol oligopolistic positions in markets that are then supported by um, mainstream law. Right, and antitrust and, and antitrust and being, so on and so nobody's forth. Nobody's used antitrust effectively in decades. And we have, you know, the, the progress out of the second industrial revolution into today's modern society, the advent of what we understand as credit offered through banks, banks' positions of power. Yep. These are all arguably ways of controlling man, the social animal, 
into forms and patterns that have evolved through the years. Yep. Now, yep. what the reason we're talking about this today is because does having something called the internet, the web, and hyperlinks and mm. blockchain architecture, mm. Mm. does this change this game at all or not? Well, <clears throat> I mean, the case you made very convincingly before is that the printing press did change the game, because the it previous took a long time. It took a long time, but the point of control where you know the church controlled access to the word of God, you know that was that was a seventeen hundred year monopoly. Yep. Right? Of the Latin Aramaic. Were there, era, were there atheists back then at all? Um, were you allowed to be, or were you burned at the stake? Well, always burned at the stake. <laughs> you know, Galileo and the rest of that. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you didn't even have to be an atheist. You just had to be non, you know, outside of the dogma. Right. A right. lot of use of force to keep that doctrine in yeah, place. Yeah. So we get to the present. You know, there's no denying that the network is radically changing people's access to knowledge. Um, the whole phenomenon that doctors went through about 10 years ago beginning to encounter patients who'd read about their disorder on the internet and came in already with a head full of opinions. Um, yeah, there are two kinds of doctors. There's the ones that are still annoyed when you don't treat them as God. Mm. And then there's a kind, like I'm the kind of person that you know reads up a great deal and I'm not stupid about something if it's bothering me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll go in and talk to the doctor and luckily I've had doctors that like having a conversation with an informed patient. Absolutely. But it changes the power relationship. Absolutely. And I mean, that sort of role, and then you see patient self-organization. Yeah. Well, so, you know, whole Communities of, of interest. People, uh, yeah, exactly. Forums. And in the long run, that could easily turn into funding, collaborative funding of research. Voila. You know, Especially if you start thinking about how to use the blockchain intelligently there. And this is where we get around to the ability to build these new power structures. Right. So, I mean, there's this thing running in, uh, on Ethereum right now called the DAO, and um, as of I mean, where are we? Middle of June 2016, they've got on the order of what, 150 million dollars. I thought it was edged closer to 200 if I, in the last thing I heard, but yeah, anyway. no, no, it's an obscene amount. A lot of money, right? Pulled together by a, a very simple democratic model of venture capital, with no clear purpose or objectives, particularly yet, other than to provide funding. Mm for initiatives that are yet to be conceived. And to generate return on investment. And to demonstrate that a new form of organization is possible, a decentralized autonomous organization. Mm. So right now, they've basically put kind of a hold on that because the DAO was not really foreseen as being something that would wind up with that much value in it. Right. So there's been a certain amount of like, this would have been okay with five mil. With 150 or 200, we kind of need to take a bit more of a look at this. So you know more about this than me. So who's the we and who took that decision to put it on hold? Ah, uh, well now, right? So as we saw with Bitcoin, you know, just because you release something doesn't mean that there's no point of authority that will automatically reform. So in the DAO, the people that release the code are not anonymous. So Stefan Tuol and his two partners in Slocket are the people that made the announcements. Okay. There's also a committee around the DAO uh, whose job it is to basically verify that when submissions come in, they're not fraudulent in principle. That the person who has said that they are making the submission is actually making the submission. So there's a gatekeeper. There are some gatekeepers. Um, and this is just as well because that's what's buying time to do the analysis sure. on whether the DAO is sufficiently secure to go to market. Don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, Often when we talk about hierarchy, people have often asked me or they think because it sounds like hierarchy, but they, you know, everybody knows mm -hmm. something is up. Mm -hmm that it means the demise of hierarchy or the death of hierarchy. I've never said that, I never will say that, mm. but what I do believe is that in committees of governance and in virtually all forms of human activity, what we are going to need and see is more intelligent, more enlightened, more feedback-driven hierarchies that exist mm. in ecosystems. They will be more temporary, more fluid, but they will be there. Yeah, and I think that we've seen inside of the uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum spaces, repeated attempts to construct these kind of interim hierarchies. So in Bitcoin, the people with the political power are the miners, because whether they choose yeah. to upgrade their software or not defines how the network operates. Yeah, until the limit of the number of Bitcoins that can be mined re is reached. Yeah, but for now, the miners are the ones cracking the whip. Yeah. And the inability to get the Bitcoin Foundation and the miners on the same page at a fundamental level has been, you know, the fundamental problem that you couldn't get enough centralization to make the platform go forward. Right. And um, so Bitcoin has found it very hard to innovate. Well, the, you use the word centralization, and I'll, and I'll never forget, <clears throat> this would be back in 1999 when I was just starting to 
scribble down some notes about about hierarchy. The last chap, the last paragraph in chapter three of a book called Future Perfect by a business theorist by the name of Stan Davis yeah. said that information systems and networks would permit the both the centralization and the decentralization simultaneously mm. of activities and therefore hierarchies and networks would coexist under some principle that would that is encompassing of both and in my opinion that's hierarchy or the way I've defined it I don't want to be as presumptuous uh, or arrogant, you know, I think it was a reasonably clever idea, but I'll always remember that paragraph about centralization and decentralization simultaneously. Yeah. That's what information systems network yeah. together permits. Yeah. And I mean, the blockchain is a really good example of that because the decentralization is enormous in that all of these different machines are all doing their own piece. And the points of decentralization are mission critical. Because this is where the code is produced. Right. So. One argument is that you could decentralize this by having lots of different implementations of the software. So right. different languages produced by different people, different implementations. Here's your Java version, here's your you know, Python version, here's your... C A horizontal version. tower of Babel. Yeah, and, but with intercompatibility between the networks. But you still wind up with this platform thing where, okay, we might have 21 implementations of the platform, but the platform itself then becomes the centralized thing. Right. Because it doesn't matter what version of the client you're running, right. you're still running the same protocol. Right. So you wind up with the centralization on a single protocol. And the notion that you've got, you know, technical decentralization, but protocol level centralization, it seems that we just continue to climb this ladder of doesn't matter what the decentralizing force is, there's always a centralizing force that comes along with it. So to come back to where we started here, in terms of reflecting on the fundamental polarity posed by Locke versus Hobbes, mm. my question to myself and to you and to anyone else that's interested is, will we always be wrestling with this fundamental issue of human nature as to whether or not it's a social animal that is Evolve. I mean, we can get into Wilberian theory about integral mm. spiraling up towards greater consciousness, or will we always be nasty in tooth and claw um, and need mechanisms to mediate conflict in order to keep some degree of social order before we kill, all kill each other? Mm. You know, I guess I'd argue is that it's probably some of both and always will be. So my escape route on this, the thing that has really given me sort of a profound sense of you know, a just future being possible, is I don't think the critical issue is actually inequality. I think it's quality of life for the worst. Sure, so, but that ties into Buckminster Fuller's aphorism, I think, often that says, you know, his goal is a 100% sustainable future for all of humankind, or whatever the, yeah. the statement is. But and if you can set a threshold for the lowest of mm -hmm. the, the worst, that is acceptable in a you moral see, sense, precisely. then we're getting somewhere. Because if you come at this from the notion that what you're trying to create is equality, the problem with equality is that it requires huge architectures of control. Right. Because things like power law distribution seem to keep re-emerging whatever your medium is. Right. If humans have freedom to choose, they seem to construct power law hierarchies. Yes. You know, factor of 10 between the most popular and the yeah, next Yeah, and let's face popular. it, some people are more driven and want, 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 and some people are less driven or driven by different things, and they're all, in some ways, reflections of that, that dichotomy. Yeah. But I mean, most of the work that I've seen, for example, in simulations, suggests that the power law stuff re-emerges even with random forces. I would forces. think so. Yeah. It just seems to be in the math. So if you focus on bringing up the level of the poorest and the least well-off to a level that we consider acceptable, if you have that as, a plot, as, a, as an objective principle, in the same way that free speech is a principle, it's possible to design implementation mechanisms that do not then crop the wings of the highest flying too much. Isn't that, though, the, the, what's been sold to people for the last 50 years under neoliberalism, a rising tide lifts all boats? Well, this was Isn't the welfare state's original model. Yeah. The problem is that the welfare state never explicitly defined its minimums. Didn't define its minimums and it deregulated anyone going for the gusto. Basically, and this is the world that we're in, which has turned. In my lifetime, I'm old enough to, and, and I'm quite idealistic. I remember, you know, demonstrating against the Vietnam War, and I've always been um, probably more liberal than most people would appreciate. Um, the world, in my opinion, in many ways, not always, has turned pretty savage pretty quickly. Well, 
I mean, I think that this is the Cold War, right? Mm. That when the Cold War ends with the Soviets losing, the balance of powers that had kept both sides reasonably well behaved was mm. withdrawn. Mm. And frankly, the Americans went nuts after 9-11 and have yep. become you know, very, very rapacious. Yeah, it's there. What's that famous phrase by Donald Rumsfeld? We're going to create the reality that uh, I forget what it is. We or we have we have the means to create reality, so we're going to. Yes. Um, and you know that's starting to blow up in their faces. Very Hobbesian. Very Hobbesian, right. indeed. And we have not seen the Lockean, you know, response, right? Because what you should it, have seen arguably is, it's beginning. What you should have seen is the United Nations. Yes. Right? But, but the United States will never allow that to happen because they've always underfunded the United Nations. They don't want a world government. And now the question is, is, do we pivot. need or will we need in the future a world government? I think we probably will. Well, I mean, the story that I've been telling a lot recently is that blockchains enable global democracy. Yeah. And that doesn't have to mean, you know, that you then appoint a ruler of the world. But if you could discover with, you know, good statistical certainty that global public opinion wanted some things and didn't want others with a really high degree confidence on the data. I think we could begin to start talking about we've had the global poll, we understand global public opinion on this matter, we encourage countries to comply with global public opinion. Because if we don't build those kind of mechanisms, I don't see how we're going to get any leverage on climate, I don't no. see how we get nanotech, yeah. I don't see how we get So there, we're back to this notion of this second superpower being the opinion uh, and... I'll, I'll come back to you know my definition of hierarchy, as a, which is just a made-up word, as an organizing principle because knowledge, trust, credibility, mm -hmm. focus on results, and a dynamic two-way flow of power and authority. That means that it's, it's not checklist. all top-down. Sorry? It's a good checklist. Yeah, I th well, I think so. I thought about it for a while, mm -hmm. like for about 35 years before the Internet came <laughs> along. But... Um, there are always actors in this definition. It's a dynamic two-way flow. It's not just mm -hmm. the citizen as a passive recipient. Yep. And it's not just the rulers as benevolent dictators. Because you're expecting separation of powers to emerge. The trust, the credibility, these these went In the separate. interfaces, in the dynamics, yeah. in the self-regulation, in the laws, uh, in the standards that are applied. Yeah. And the two-way two exchange of power is fascinating. Because, yeah. I mean, this is very... So in, in the uh, blockchain systems, a lot of power resides in things that we call oracles. I don't know about that. Um, so an oracle is something that tells you what the current temperature is in Iowa City. Okay. Right. It's some interface to the external world that registers a set of facts into the blockchain okay. so that your contracts can make decisions. And there's always been a question about how centralized will the oracles be and will they turn into points of control or can you make sure the oracles mm. stay decentralized? Mm. But the notion that the oracles and the miners are fundamentally different, mm -hmm. right? The oracles, the miners, the people making the software, mm -hmm. you know, you've got a kind of tripartite system there mm -hmm. and of specialized technical capabilities that are hard to replicate right? Um, that are likely to therefore remain separate as powers. Now, <clears throat> is, is there, would there be, for those, those points of power, would there be some equivalent of a Hippocratic Oath that they are there to serve? <sighs> well, I mean... If they're anonymous, who watches the watchman? Right. On the other hand, if you've got you know fifty thousand scenarios, that's a scenario so for some pretty interesting sci-fi movies. Oh, well, yes, which we're <laughs> going to wind up living quite soon. Yeah. But if you've got fifty thousand dollars of somebody's capital tied up in a set of smart contracts, where if they lie, you can take their money, the prospect is that you could hold people to account in a very granular way. Yeah. Um, and the notion that you've got a kind of democratic or pseudo-democratic capability to hold people to account, resulting in fair play, you know, in a lot of ways, I think if we asked Vitalik about this, he'd say basically it's Hobbes' world model and Locke's goals. That's a nice way of putting it. Um, if, you, if you have a strong enough technical architecture, yeah, yeah. you can take the competitive structure of nature red and tooth Well, that would be the utopian theoretical uh, statement of purpose. But it's also how function. mining works, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mining produces a fair level playing field mm -hmm. through relentless, ruthless competition to obtain results. Right. The whole crypto economic breakthrough at the heart of these systems, which Vitalik is such a master of expressing uh, and building on, is that if you correctly architect the competitive games and give the correct incentives, the competition for resources results in a level playing field for everybody. 
I wonder if it's time for a reread of Stephen Johnson's book, Emergence, The Connected Lives of Bra um, Brains, Amps, and Cities. Mm. Well, indeed. Because he, he posits in that that the connected life that we're beginning, and that was a book that was written 10, 12, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. um, really only needs, just like from good game theory, two yep. or three simple rules. Yep. That's interesting. Certainly in this domain, the notion that you can take relatively simple patterns of behavior with the right incentive structures and produce very complex emergent behavior is a big part of it. Yeah. You know, the mining systems are very, very simple compared to the complexity of the transactional systems that they facilitate, for example. Right. Right. Um, and that notion that the ruthless competition at the Hobbesian level is the underpinning support for the Lockean level that our, our justice and our democracy of the blockchain is fair and it records history accurately, is secured by the competition to mine quickly. I think that we might discover that, you know, that was the aspiration of the free market, but the corruption of the human systems that provided control through things like revolving door between corporations and government and courts. You know, if you think of this as being essentially free market economics minus the revolving doors, maybe we're in a position where it's a technical nudge towards justice and it's just enough to work. That sounds very, very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm also conscious of, you know, bringing this back to the average Jane and Joe in the street in a suburb who are still, you know, they've got a smartphone and they use, they know about the web and they have Facebook and they browse for the weather and their stock prices and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, the blockchain will be something alien to them uh, and so on and and we know that we're also facing significant amounts of automation algorithms oh, robots oh, oh, uh, etc yeah. etc which we've we've kinds. we've had a very rapid rise in the notion of guaranteed annual incomes or universal basic incomes with predictably you know business people on the right saying this is never going to work it's administratively too problematic the recent referendum in switzerland which was roundly defeated but I don't see a way around having to have some of that because there are millions of people that will be just wandering around dazed by well, this whole techno techno economic tsunami that's about to land. Yes, including me, frankly. And me, I'm I'm old enough to. I'm not going to go off into the woods in a couple more years. <laughs> so, number one job in the U.S. is driver. It's the single yeah. most common job. Which could disappear in the next five years. Self-driving everything. You know, heavy freight, particularly, you know, all the interesting Well, stuff. I've, I've seen Taxes. avatars with AI that, you, you know, you you will not need, and particularly if married with the blockchain, but notaries, mm -hmm. paralegals, maybe even most lawyers, arguably a fair number of professors for, for you know, basic courses. Mm -hmm. um, I said lawyers, I think, doc GPs. Yep. I've seen some really smart avatars that are really good at questioning patients. Yep. And the answers go into databases and there's cameras focused on the emotions of, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. of the patients responding to the clients. And, you know, another 10 years, a lot of this will be in place. One of the things I think would be worth trying is doing basic income on blockchains, but not mm. setting a value for the basic income. Mm. So. If we set up a system in the UK of giving everybody a thousand tokens a month, right, marked on a blockchain, but we didn't set a market value for the tokens, I wonder how long it would take for them to establish a market value and become tradable. And or maybe even many smaller markets in communities. Yes. Because the other question we haven't really touched on about energy is if energy systems and logistics, the way we understand them today, break, whether electric or um, oil-based, we will have to be able to go to local proximity-based economies pretty quickly. And that is a much bigger can of worms than we have time for. But we are doing a bit of work on it. Um, we have a project called Cotricity, okay. which is renewable energy on blockchains. Okay. And I think it's the beginning of quite a big transformation in those fields. I think um, I read something about Cotricity. I think I passed it on to someone. But yeah, John's doing it. So, um, thank you. Lovely. <coughs> More <Motion. laughs>